If you would recall, <clears throat> last week we introduced the Taylor series, approximating a function near a point. This is just a Taylor polynomial, but keep going. So what we're doing is we're taking a Taylor polynomial, we keep going, and then it becomes a Taylor series. A Taylor series is just a power series, but with a particular coefficient. It's a Taylor, it's a power series with the coefficient defined this way based on a function. And since we're dealing with the power series, we always have to remember our primary concern is what is the interval of convergence for the power series? We need to identify some power series that we should recognize. So there are some common power series, or sorry, Taylor series. So the first one that we looked at was e to the x. This was easy to develop because the derivative of e to the x is always e to the x. So when we plug in zero, we always get one. We're just getting one over n factorial for our coefficient when we're centered at zero. We need to know the interval of convergence. We know that we uh, can make an up. If we stop writing the Taylor series, we've written a polynomial approximating a function near a point. We need to know um, where that approximation works. When we look at this power series, x to the n over n factorial, we see the n factorial in the denominator. That's going to leave behind an n plus 1 in the limit from the ratio test. So the limit from the ratio test will go to 0 regardless of the value of x. So the interval of convergence is all real numbers. We look at a few more. Common Taylor series. So sine x is the odd one. Sine x is the odd one. So remember with sine and cosine, we should have alternating. Sine will have all the odd powers and cosine will have all even powers. So we need to get the alternating. And we need to start out odd. Today I started with n equals zero. I can't remember what I, that's mainly because I can't remember what I started with on Wednesday. It doesn't matter, we're just trying to summarize. So uh, I need to start off with one. So I'll say two n plus one for the exponent and the factorial in the denominator. So this will start off with, uh, when n is equal to zero, this will start off positive from the negative one to the n, and it'll start off with an x to the first power over one factorial. This is a power series. We'll want to know for what values of x this power series converges. And the factorial in the denominator, unchecked by any factorial type stuff in the numerator, should lead us to believe that this should converge for all real numbers. We use an infinite number of terms. This power series will look like sine x. If we stop at any point, then clearly that stops because it starts doing polynomial behavior where the ends go in opposite directions. 
and sine of x wants to keep oscillating. Another one that we should recognize is cosine x. Cosine x is the odd one. Not because it's unusual, it, or sorry, cosine x is the even one. So the things that we want to get are the alternating, and then we want even powers. Now we found these three, we found these three Taylor series by taking derivatives, plugging in zero, and then plugging into Taylor's formula. But we want to avoid that whole take derivatives business. So if, for example, instead of cosine x, So remember the brief here is avoid just taking derivatives. Just because we have the power to take the derivative of any function we happen to be looking at, doesn't mean that we should take the derivative of any function we happen to be looking at, even if it starts off small enough, like cosine of x cubed. So we're going to look at cosine and think of it as this power series. I don't know if we discovered this last time or if I just told you this is how it works, but we can plug things into the function and we can plug thing, that same thing into the power series or the Taylor series. So if I have a cosine of, let's say, x cubed, easy enough to take the first derivative, rid of the cosine of x cubed is negative sine of x cubed times 3x squared. But now we have to start using the product rule and the chain rule. So I'll have a combination of cosines and x squareds, some sines and x cubes. So I've got chain rules and product rules all over the place. Fortunately, we can just plug x cubed into the power series. and simplify. And then now we have the power series for cosine of x cubed. We can plug stuff into our power series. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't be writing equals in between the two. If we plugged in the same thing on both sides and got something different, I wouldn't be allowed to use the equal sign. So x cubed to the 2n will be x to the 6n. So we'll start off with 1 minus x to the 6th. 
over two factorial plus x to the 12th over four factorial minus x to the 18 over six factorial. We definitely would not want to be taking derivatives to find this Taylor series. When we plug in zero to the function, we get one, but we're going to get zero for the next five derivatives. The first, second, third, fourth, and fifth derivatives are all going to be zero when x equals zero. It's not until we get x to the sixth that we get one or x negative one. And then we'd have to take Another six derivatives to get x to the 12th, just to find that the next coefficient is a positive one. So just to get these four terms, the first four non-zero terms in the Taylor series for uh, cosine of x cubed, we'd have to take 18 derivatives. That seems awful. Any questions? So you just seen the um, mean to cosine of Correct. Just plug in, uh, just make a composition with the Taylor series rather than start with cosine of x cubed and start taking derivatives. Just these four non zero terms would cost us 18 derivatives. Yes. So the goal here then is to find the value. No, our, our goal is to take a function and write it as a power series. Our goal is to write the function as a power series. At this point in our mathematical lives, we have huge amounts of computing power. So cosine of x cubed is just as good as any polynomial. But if we have less computing power, rather than doing this transcendental business with the cosine, we can just approximate it with an algebraic function. Here's an 18th degree polynomial approximating cosine of x cubed. So the goal is to take our function and imagine it as a polynomial, a polynomial that we can easily expand to be more accurate by adding more terms. That's mechanically what we're trying to do. Conceptually, the thing that we have to get over is that we can take any function that has derivatives and we can approximate it with a polynomial. That is pretty dope. You don't really recognize that until later. A lot of times in math, there's like this big delay between when you get introduced to some cool thing and when you realize the implications of that cool thing. Kind of one of the important, uh, uh, one of the uh, frustrating things about trying to learn math. Usually when there's a song that happens, usually you hear a song, and we kind of immediately think that's cool. And we think, oh, this is why I like that. It's not like we hear a song and then years later, we like, oh, oh, holy shit, that's an awesome song, right? Usually just like connects right at the beginning. <laughs> we keep this getting distracted. If we didn't have to worry about all this stupid math, maybe we would have more time to spend listening to music. All right, 
So the, the brief here is that we want to avoid taking derivatives. We can take derivatives to build the Taylor series, but let's take things that we know already. Like the Taylor series for cosine X, we found not by taking derivatives of cosine and plugging in zero, we just took the series for sine X and we took the derivative of the series term by term. And then that gave us a series for cosine X. Then we confirm that this was indeed the series for cosine X by taking derivatives of cosine X. How's everybody okay? You know what? I do not want that much. That, that's too far. So here's another example of taking derivatives would be a lot of product. So rather than taking derivatives, since I know the series, the Taylor series for e to the two x, and I know the Taylor series for e to the, uh, for cosine x, I can just multiply those two series. So rather than take derivatives, Instead of taking derivatives, we're just going to multiply the Taylor series to get the Taylor series for this product function. So I'm going to write the series for e to the 2x. Is multiply the series for e to the 2x, where I just write the series for e to the x with the 2x plugged in. And I'll multiply this by the series for cosine x. Now this seems like a gigantic FOIL project, but it's not really a FOIL project because L in FOIL stands for last and there is no last. These both keep going on forever, but we're writing the polynomial or the series. We're writing the series starting from the degree zero terms and moving up. So there's only one product that will give us a degree zero term here. We'll find that one times one. That's the only instance of a degree zero term. So if we look at the degree, let's 
let's think about the degree of the term that we're going to get in the products. There is only one way to get that degree zero term. From the degree zero term here in the e to the two x and the degree zero term from cosine x. So the first term in my Taylor series is going to be one times one or one. Remember that when we multiply a degree two term by a degree three term, we'll have a degree five term. Degree is additive under multiplication. So if we look at what we have uh, in the first polynomial, we got zero, one, two, and three, and the second polynomial, sorry, series, zero, two, four, and six, there's only one degree one term, and it has to be two X. There's no other way to get a degree one term other than to multiply the degree zero term from cosine and the degree one term from e to the two X. So the next term will have to be two X. If we look at degree two terms, the only way we're gonna get a degree two term is a zero and the two or the two and the zero. Everything else will be higher degree. So the only terms that we're gonna get for degree two are gonna be one times minus X squared over two factorial And then the 2x squared over 2 factorial times the 1. So here's our degree 0 term. We're having to think beyond FOIL, we're gonna to have to think about how multiplication is supposed to work. That's the point of this exercise. Now we'll write that, those are all the possible degree two terms, zero plus two or two plus zero. <clears throat> For degree three terms, I'm not gonna be using this zero degree term from, from e to the two x, because zero time, these are all even. There's no degree three term from that. I will get a degree three term when I multiply the two X times the minus X squared over two factorial. So they'd be a two X times minus X squared over two factorial, that's degree three. will be minus 2x times x squared over 2 factorial. That's degree 1 times degree 2. The other degree 3 term I can get is the degree 3 from e to the 2x and the degree 0 from cosine of x. For degree four terms, I can have the zero and the four, the two and the two, or the zero and the four that I haven't written down here. All we're doing is trying to summarize what FOIL would do for us. 
If I was to just start multiplying this out, I'd multiply every, uh, everything in the cosine x by one. So I get one minus x squared over two factorial and so on. Then I would go through and multiply everything by two x. Then I'd multiply everything by two x squared over two factorial and then two x cubed over three factorial. It's the same multiplication that we're doing. We're just trying to cut out a lot of the middle band. I don't want to have to write down. So here's going to be our first degree four term. If I think about this multiplication, I'd have one times one minus um, x one times x squared over two factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial minus x to the sixth over six factorial. Then I would have to go through and multiply by the two x, two x times one, two uh, x cubed over two factorial plus two x to the fifth over four factorial minus two x to the seventh over six factorial. Then I have to multiply by the four x squared over two factorial. But, uh, and this is why I don't do this. I'd have the two factorial, this should have two two factorial, right? And then four X squared times X to the six is four X to the eight. Two factorial and a six factorial. Then we just need to pick out the degree zero terms. Here's a degree zero term. Here's the degree one term. The degree two term happens here. There's degree two, there's degree two. The degree three term happens here. Here's degree three. Oh, and there would be another one here. Any questions? It's just multiplication. It's the same multiplication that you did way back in algebra when you first learned about polynomials. It's just messier because there are more terms. Is everybody okay? Algebra. We. Everybody's favorite. It's always funny. Students be turning in their algebra files and like, "Woo, finally done with algebra!" I'm like, "Oh, oh no, you're not." Algebra forever. So I'm just tracking the degree of each of the terms and see how quickly they escalate. Should be a four. The point is, as, as weird as this is, it's better than taking um, derivatives of e to the two x times cosine of x.
all the, there's no L. Oh, there's not really an outer. Because outer is like the first one on the first one and then the last one, but there is no last. So it's really just And really, I just write that down to see how many people I can get to write in their notebooks. One of the things that we like about Taylor series is that we don't have to take all these derivatives. That's the point of being in a math class. Learn the math enough so that you don't have to do all that math anymore. We don't want to have to run a ratio test every single time by writing out the details of the ratio test. We just want to be able to look at the series and decide what's going to happen. And so that's why I want to organize things into that hierarchy. Factorials, exponentials, polynomial and radical, and then numerator versus denominator. Same kind of thing with Taylor series. We just want to know some base Taylor series and then see if we can get new Taylor series by manipulating the ones that we know. How's everybody okay? Incorrect, you're not okay. If you think you're okay, you should be concerned. If you think, oh yeah, this is totally easy. You are incorrect. You need to think about it more. Does that make sense? There's that curve as you build confidence. When you know nothing, you know that you don't know anything. And so you're like low on the confidence scale. But as you learn stuff, you increase. But then what needs to happen is that you learn more stuff. You need to start realizing all the things that you don't know and your confidence should start to decrease. This is normal. Sometimes in math class, the instructor will pick the easy examples, usually because they don't wanna work very hard. They'll probably come up with some other kind of depth of rationalization. We're doing the easy ones in class. But it builds early confidence that later gets shattered when you get more complicated problems. Does that make sense? Is that a familiar experience? Look how easy it is. And then you start doing some problems like, oh, this isn't easy. And when you email your instructor, they just email back, ha, 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 like the Joker or some shit. Very cruel. I mean, I'm not saying that I don't do that. I totally do that. I'll do the easy examples in class, turn you loose on some homework and you, students will be like, oh, oh, so the homework is just like the stuff we did in class. I'm like, oh, mm, yeah, sure. <laughs> They're like, well, why did you laugh? It's like, oh, I didn't. I just thought of something, something funny. Don't worry about it. Just go do the homework. It should go real quick because you understand it, right? I, I, I can't not do that. I, I don't know if it's in my nature because I'm human if it's in my nature because I'm a teacher or is it in my training because I'm a teacher? I, have, I don't know where it comes from. It's like this cruelty streak that all teachers tend to have. You know what I mean? I blame society. Probably. And it doesn't help anybody. Okay. 
And that's the, that's the great challenge of being a teacher. Besides, like, depending on what level your teacher gets, besides, like, you know, surviving on the pay. But um, the great challenge is can you get over the bad methods? that you learned as a student, or do you just perpetuate the cycle? See also parenting. Can you break the cycles of bad parenting that you were subject to? You know what I mean? Like the parents that like, oh, well, I was beaten as a kid, I turned out fine. It's like, well, not if you beat your kids. You don't, you didn't. If you beat your kids, you didn't turn out fine. You're just continuing the cycle of abuse. And the same thing happens with teachers. Teachers like, oh, well, I was abused. Not like physically. Not like Catholic school from the 70s style. But the main thing that you deal with, and you'll find this out if you become a teacher, and you teach people that have been through math classes before, very niche market, I know you'll realize that it's less about teaching people math and more about dealing with trauma. I need to have more psychological training than I need math training. You know what I mean? Math training is all well and good, but if you can't deal with people's trauma, then it doesn't matter. Case in point, there was one, one time I was working at a school and in the department of 10 people, there were two total degrees in math. I had them both. I was by far the worst teacher in that entire department because I had zero experience. I just walked in and I did not know how to deal with teenagers. No training in that area. All I knew was math and I could not cope. You know what I mean? It didn't matter that I knew all this math. I didn't know how to deal with people. I think some companies are finally coming around to this. And they start to care more about soft skills. This is a company with a bunch of people in it. You're not going to be isolated in a cubicle, making sure you use the correct cover sheets on the PPS reports. You're going to have to deal with people. And if you come in with a 4.0 or 5.0 from an Ivy League university and you can't talk to people, I don't think I want to hire you. If I can't have a conversation with you, if you can't explain the things that you're thinking, then you're not going to do us any good. Does that make sense? There's like the mechanical bits. That's not, that's not going to translate into teaching well. You know what I mean? It's like master class. Have you ever heard of master class? It's where they get famous people who are very accomplished to teach a class in the thing that they do. And I have no doubt that I, don't know, I now have to pick someone that's good at something. I have zero doubt that what's that? Hillary. Hillary's on there. I don't know what her class is in. Um, I'm going to pick someone that I really like. And I think he has a magic class. Neil Gaiman, one of my favorite writers, one of my favorite storytellers. I have no doubt in his expertise as a storyteller, as a writer, no question. But does that automatically mean he's going to make for a good teacher? We don't know until he tries, right? Dead Mouse, I think, has a class. Might be on a different platform. No doubt, he's extraordinarily good at what he does. Can he explain what makes him good? 
I'm not, I'm not really sure. You know what I mean? It's a different skill set. And for the most part, every teacher that you've encountered has not been trained to do that job, especially now that you're here at the college level. The total amount of training that I've had where I sit down and say, well, we're going to teach you how to be a teacher. The total amount of training that I've had is one hour in my 20 year career. 20 years. Going back that far. 27 year career. One hour. Sat down. I go, okay, graduate teaching associates. Here's your book. Here's how to read the schedule. Here are the forms that you're going to need to turn into the semester because we didn't have the internet and computer systems back then. We had to turn in actual paper forms. Here's how you fill out those forms. Here's where you turn them in. Don't date your students. Good luck. That was it. That's the sum fucking total of my training to be a teacher. Everything else I've had to figure out on my own. If I had the time, then I could go talk to one of the uh, one of my other professors. But no one ever checked in with me and said, what are you struggling with? What's working? What's not working? Have you tried this? If I wanted mentoring, I had to go seek it out. Incidentally, for those of you who become teachers, I'm going to give you this advice for free. Um, it was the best piece of advice that I think I ever got. I walked in, I, I went to see uh, Dr. Black, one of my favorite professors um, at Cal State East Bay, was Cal State Hayward at the time. I sat down I, and I was working as a reader for her, one of her classes and starting to teach class. I said, Dr. Glass, how do you know if you're doing this right? And she said, well, at the end of, this, at the, end of the quarter, if they learn something and they don't hate you, you did fine. So that's it. That was, that's what I learned something and don't hate you. Those are my two criteria. It wasn't learn everything on this list because that's a bullshit requirement. What does it mean to learn everything on the list? Take a look at the list of topics for this class. What does it mean to know that stuff? Because there ain't no way that you know it to the degree that I do. If you have to know it to the degree I do, we're going to be here a lot longer. Because my expertise in these kinds of things, that took me 20 some odd years to build. We ain't got that kind of time. How many things can you actually walk out of math class with? I think I brought this up. You all have been through algebra classes, right? Someone tell me what the fundamental theorem of algebra is. Should be important, right? We did that in the first semester, at the end of the first semester, but we talked about the fundamental theorem of calculus. I might call this is important because it's right in the name, fundamental theorem. There's a fundamental theorem of algebra. You all have been through algebra class. Don't tell me what it is. Weird how something so important that we would call it a fundamental theorem can slip by. You know what I mean? Y'all are good at arithmetic, right? That's probably what happened. You were good at arithmetic. You were good at arithmetic in the limited way. You were good at arithmetic in base 10. How many of you actually understand how counting works? Not to count, because you can count in base 10, no question about that. Explain to me how counting works. And you're like, oh, well, no one ever told me that, which is false. You absolutely were told how counting works. It just wasn't important because when it came down to it, you as the student had to do the thing called test. And you didn't know, have to understand how counting worked. You just had to be able to do the things. There was a page that had 60 problems on it. Single digit addition, single digit multiplication, making sure you know your time statements. You know what I mean? So, uh, and that has gone so far as people to say, oh, you didn't teach me how to do my taxes. 
And like, oh, bitch, we taught you how to read and we taught you how to do math. And that's what doing your taxes is, reading and doing math. The fact that we still do taxes that way, that's the wrong thing. But we get so wrapped up in this painful process that we just want done, that we'll pay someone to get it done for us, right? I wonder who's fighting to keep the system the way it is. Could it be the largest seasonal employer in the entire country? I wonder. Anyway. So yeah, uh, most people probably keep the way they were taught. Some of us think maybe there's a better way to do it and we're completely ill-equipped to try to figure that out. But we're working on it. All right, uh, tomorrow we'll talk about the binomial series. Speaking of building a series and then building on that, this is gonna be a big the binomial series. Good to say the whole day. That's it for today. I'll see y'all on tomorrow, but have a good day and thanks for playing. Oh shit, thanks for staying. You don't want overtime. <laughs>